Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with me today. I've prepared another presentation in our series. This is titled Retrievals of the Third Kind Part Two. We've got a lot of information to uh, go over with you, so I want to go ahead and get into the material here and we'll move forward. So again, Retrievals of the Third Kind Part Two. Uh, first case here, the reference for this is called The Other Roswell UFO Crash on the Texas-Mexico Border, and the reference sources are Noe Torres and my good friend Ruben. This involves a very interesting case. This is spring 1955 across the Texas-Mexican border south of Del Rio, Texas. And uh, again, this is the source of the material. I'm going to go ahead and move forward, which will show you the map on where this actually took place. So if you look on the top part of this map, you'll see Del Rio, Texas there, and then directly south, you've got the Rio Grande River here, and the location of where this event took place is this area right in here. Uh, I'm gonna go back one, and what we have here is a series of B-47 bombers heading westbound over Texas, and they were being escorted by at least two F-86 Sabre jets, and all of a sudden, this dish-shaped craft comes screaming by their flight path, and this thing actually crashes on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande River, south of Del Rio, Texas. So one of these F-86 peels off, he separates from the group, he does a low pass, and he sees the entire scene. He sees this dish-shaped craft, it's kind of got some smoking debris here, uh, he can see how it augured in, he saw the entire thing. So he ended up returning his F-86 to Carswell Air Force Base, where he got in a small tail dragger known as an Aranka. And I'll move forward here. Again, this is the map of the location where it took, took place. So he gets in this Aranka, he flies back to the crash site, and he sees this entire scene. Now, I want to give credit to Rudy Gardea as my artist who did this sketch. And we'll kind of break this down here. So on the foreground out onto the right, you can see this two-place Aranka, and he had a friend with him. And as this thing augured in, it was 25 feet in diameter, it was five feet tall, the dome on this craft popped off, and there were Mexican soldiers surrounding this. Uh, they had a troop transport off to the left, there was a Jeep, and then there was at least one US Navy personnel at the scene. And this is before the military, the United States military got involved in this. And I talked to Ruben and he mentioned that it was getting a little bit cold. And what the Mexican soldiers were doing is they were taking blankets, they were putting it on part, portions of the debris that you see in this debris path here. And they were heating it up and then putting that on their bodies to, to heat their bodies up. So just an interesting point here. Uh, at, at this point, he did notice that there was one body retrieved and associated with this particular crash retrieval. And so this is spring 1955. And we'll go ahead and move forward here. Next one, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is 1955. And this has to do with a woman known as Mrs. G. And she was a part of the Foreign Materials Division at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And this is via information provided by Charles Wilhelm, Source UFO Crash Retrievals, page 17, abstract number 12. So that's the reference for this. And I want to be able to give you the references so that you can actually verify this on your own. Now, what does this case entail here? We'll move forward here. Let's see if we can get into this. If you look at this slide, you'll see this kind of a Indiana Jones scene here. You've got this big warehouse expansive warehouse with these boxes and these shelving. And this is what it might have looked like, according to Mrs. G. And we'll kind of get into what she was involved in here. If I move forward here, you can see this is the, the building at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is Warehouse Operations Building 258. Now, this may be almost identical to what Mrs. G had talked about. And what she described, and we'll go ahead and move forward one side here. She describes how stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, she was present where, and I, this is exactly what she said, a thousand pieces and components from a UFO crash retrieval came in into the base. 
And uh, what they were doing is, and if you look in the background, another drawing by Rudy here, you can see that they were photographing the debris, they were bagging and tagging, and it was her job to catalog all of this debris. And she also mentioned that there was this rolling dolly that went by that had two beings that were about three and a half feet to four feet tall. They had oversized head. They were kind of being suspended in this liquid uh, preservation fluid. And uh, can you imagine a thousand pieces from a UFO crash retrieval interior? She was there, she saw it. And so what we've done here, and Rudy's done a fantastic job, off to the right and left, we've got these shelving from all this UFO crash retrieval debris put on the shelving here. And in the back, we've got even more shelves that can come out. A thousand pieces were cataloged by this lady. And so the government can't say that they don't have the debris or the evidence or the physical evidence, they've got it. And just before she died, she told Charles Wilhelm, quote, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. So credit goes to Mrs. G for coming forward and telling us about this incredible account. Next one, this is a source was a retired Air Force pilot late 1950s, and this specifically has to do with a black and white motion picture film reel that was about five to six minutes in length, and the interview conducted by Ed Comerat Jr., five to six minutes in film, uh, this craft was about 60 feet in diameter with a 10-foot wide gash on the side, so there was shrapnel, there was conduit, there was debris sticking out, and in this motion picture film clip, he said that he saw control panels, lettering, symbols, and star charts on the inside. And he also said that laying on the floor next to this 60-foot diameter dish-shaped craft were three bodies, and they were about five feet tall. So let's kind of zoom in here, and you can see that when this craft came down, what it appears that happened is the propulsion system or central core of the craft continue moving forward within the dome of the craft and punctured a hole right through the side of the craft itself. Now I wanna take you kind of a detailed view and we'll enlarge this. Again, credit goes to Rudy for doing these wonderful drawings, making these cases come alive. Up on the top, we've got this troop transport and it shows you what the interior of this core section, the propulsion system of this UFO may have looked like. And then on the bottom, we've got these advanced enhanced drawings of these display screens, uh, control panels. There could have been buttons and switches and dials and levers, star charts he described as well. So again, they apparently have the debris. They absolutely have the proof and we'll move on here. Okay, now this one, very good case. And there's some interesting dialogue that goes on with this case. And all of this can be found in UFO crash retrievals sources, page 88. Case A6, and uh, we'll go ahead and do an enlargement here. Wright Patterson Air Force Base, this is April 1962, and this was seen by an exchange pilot who was part of the 354th Tactical Air Command Fighter Wing. And so he was in charge of the physical fitness of these other pilots that were kind of transient. And so they're, they're running down this section of the uh, hangar section where there were two baseball diamonds. And as they passed the baseball diamonds, there was a row of hangers and they went into this one particular hangar. They were looking for a kind of a mobile racquetball court and they were gonna suspend two other walls to make a complete racquetball court. And when they got into this one hangar, they saw this 15 foot diameter dish shaped craft. Uh, it was suspended by two engine test stands. It had kind of a rope around it. And then there were MPs with rifles guarding this craft. And he saw this. He, he actually stated that this looked like a track and field discus. That's exactly how he described this particular particular craft. And I want to move forward here and, and give you what he said here. Uh, the guard challenged by saying, quote, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. I replied to the affirmative and we turned about face and departed, mumbling to ourselves that the good old U.S. had developed or had all along flying saucers in service. So I thought that was interesting that, you know, even they felt that, yep, we, we've got them. Whether we made them, reverse engineered, or recovered them, they have them in their possession. So we'll move forward here. Next one. This is reference number 53, who is a Navy captain. 
he encountered a 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and the source is PJ, a captain in the Navy and a pilot for Braniff Airlines, date 1963. So as we're moving through all these parts of this detailed investigation in the UFO crash retrievals, we keep hearing again and again and again that all roads appear to lead to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but not just at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Also, things going on at Homestead Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, McDill Air Force Base, and then Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. So obviously they're keeping these things under wraps and they move these from place to place to keep it under wraps. And we'll move on to the next case here. Okay, next one, Fort Riley, Kansas, December 10th, 1964. This is involved with a private who was a first class uh, UFO crash retrievals, page 24, abstract 20 by Leonard Stringfield. Now in this particular case, there were four people involved with this particular case and they were told to go to this location by way of a troop transport truck. And this is the map which shows you the location on where this actually took place. Map of Camp Foresight, which indicates general area where the UFO came down. So once they go into this troop transport, they're driven about a mile into the, to the location, they get off and they hike another half mile into kind of a clearing. And what do they see when they get to this clearing? We'll move forward here. What they end up seeing is this craft right here. <laughs> it's a very interesting design, something that you don't generally see, but this craft was 48 feet in diameter. It was 18 feet kind of tall. It looked like a fat hamburger. And then it had these 20 inch by 20 inch square protrusion sticking out and were circling the outer circumference of the craft itself. It had a fin at the back and at the very back there was a protrusion that looked like it might be some type of an exhaust. So again this is December 1964 is a correct date on this particular case. So this was my first pass color illustration in SOLIDWORKS just to give you an idea of what this craft may actually have looked like and it's it's accurate per the original witness sketch. And then let's go ahead and get Rudy's drawing here. This actually happened at night and there was a Huey helicopter hovering over this craft, shining a spotlight down. His job was to guard it and walk around it. And he also said that there were personnel with Geiger counters that were walking around this. They were trying to see if this thing was hot. So again, they've got, they've got the proof. They've got the physical evidence. Now there are two separate sources in conjunction with the original source that actually helped to confirm this case. Now, one of them stated that he was at Fort Riley, Kansas afterward and saw the same craft on a U.S. Army M123 tractor trailer, which was used during the recovery operation. He saw this on this particular M123. Later on, another source claimed that the people involved in the retrieval operation they were uh, members of a retrieval team and they wore chemical biological protective suits and masks. So in this particular case, we've got three independent sources that help to actually verify this particular crash retrieval operation. Next one, and this one has got to be one of the most strange, bizarre, crazy cases, but it's within the string field file. So it's important that we consider it as a uh, possible historical case. Okay, so setting up the scene, it's the Air Force Museum, Dayton, Ohio. It's 1965, UFO crash retrievals, page 153, case three. Now, there was a couple that visited the Air Force Museum and the wife stayed looking at the V2 rocket display. I'll move, I'll move forward here. So she's looking at the V2 rocket display, as, as you see here. And he took off. He left her stranded at this V2 rocket display. He just completely took off. He's wandering down this hallway. He gets to these uh, door, double doors and they have a label on them. You're not supposed to go through. This is kind of a restricted area. You're not allowed to, to go in here. He, he busts through anyway. And what does he see? <laughs> what does he see when he gets through? He sees this being right here, three and a half feet to four feet tall almost no nose, a slit for a mouth, very large eyes, 
and it has a very heavy brow ridge. He mentioned that as well. And this particular being was walking around in this corridor and he had this kind of one piece wrinkled flight suit that looked like it came from the Mercury space era. It was all silver. He was wearing kind of a helmet and he pointed to the primary eyewitness. And uh, it was just a bizarre sight. Within about 30 seconds of this actually taking place, all these buzzers and alarms and red lights started going, going off. Whatever this being was took off. And so it, what it indicates is that there may be an underground tunnel system that connects the Air Force Museum to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And this thing may have gotten loose. So up on the upper left, you can see Rudy's detailed drawing that shows you the wife looking at the B-2 rocket display. On the bottom right, we've done an, an enlarged view that shows you once these buzzers went off, these MPs within the Air Force Museum started ushering everybody out, out the doors. And this, whatever this being was, triggered this alarm system. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next case here. Now, this is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 1966, a civil uh, service electrician, <clears throat> he was present at this location. And I think it's very important that we consider this because this is another very interesting case, sources UFO crash retrievals, page 17, abstract 13. So what happened in this case? This involves a worker who came home at Dayton, Ohio, because he was working at the base. His two sons were present and he kind of had this trench coat on and he said, you know, I want to show you something. And so he reached inside his pocket of his trench coat and he pulled out, it st states in the report, an eight by 10 glossy black and white photograph depicting a three and a half foot tall alien being being held up in a Southwest environment, could be Arizona, could be New Mexico. On the left, there was a white lab coat technician. On the right, there was a man who was wearing khakis, and they were both holding this being up by one of its arms. And the son got to see this thing, and he was shocked. It was just absolutely shocked. Uh, and, and then he told his son, I can't keep it. He brought it back to the base the next day, but they noticed it was missing. He got in tremendous amount of trouble, and he actually lost his job. So again, they've got the photographic evidence. According to Mrs. G, they've got the physical evidence, they've got the hardware, they've got the bodies and the craft. So we just can't go on anymore thinking that the U.S. government does not have the evidence. Next one, Fort Hood, late 1960s, source UFO crash retrievals, page 91 by Leonard Stringfield. This is a very interesting case. So much involved in this and the implications of what this means if this case is true. And I think it's totally true. I really do. A lot of supporting evidence is just staggering. So what is involved here is we are dealing with Fort Hood Gray Army Airfield. Within Fort Hood, there's something called Robert Gray Army Airfield. And at this location, there is a tremendous, repeat, tremendous amount of helicopter activity, just a tremendous amount. You've got UH-1s, you've got CH-47s, just a tremendous amount of helicopter activity. And in this particular case, it's late 1969, and the Cessna 172 pilot, he makes an emergency landing at Gray Army Airfield. And you can see on the upper part of Rudy's drawing here, the Cessna 172, he comes down on this dirt field. Immediately, he is met by MPs in a Jeep with their handguns pointed at him and he's shocked. He's just completely surprised. Where do these guys come from? They came from nowhere. Uh, as all this is going down, he notices this massive bypass door opens up and he didn't notice it before because on the top surface of the bypass door, there is vegetation, there's trees, there's shrubbery, there's some dirt on there. And so what they do to hide these underground facilities, they put vegetation and trees on, but you can't tell. And when these bypass doors opened up, he could see the inside of a massive underground facility. So what would be inside this facility? Well, there would be a computer bank. There would be a Meglev train. 
You would have uh, dish-shaped craft on test flights. You would have later on the cash landrum craft, which was a double ice cream cone. This is December 29th, 1980, Huffman, Texas. You would have the March 23, 1966 Temple, Oklahoma case with Eddie Laxon. And we've got multiple reports of UFOs coming from this facility that are being escorted by military helicopters. That has been going on for decades. Multiple eyewitnesses confirm this. And here we've got a CH-47. These things are escorting UFOs. It's being seen at Fort Hood for decades, no doubt about it. So the, the question here is, is there a vast top secret underground facility at Gray Army Airfield? I think we can say, yes, there is, because there's a tremendous body of evidence, eyewitness reports stating that these things are coming from these underground facilities at this location. Definitely something that we should consider. Let's move on to the next case here. Now, this is Great Lakes Naval Training Center, 1973. This involves a gunnery school instructor who guarded a Quonset style building. Sources, UFO crash retrievals, page 89, Case A7 by Leonard Stringfield. So what this particular gunnery school instructor was doing is he was guarding a Quonset style hut on kind of a remote part of Great Lakes Naval Training Center. This is in the Chicagoland area. So he's guarding this and he was told to keep anyone that approached this at least 100 yards away. Later on, and while he's doing this, he is told to deliver a important package to the commanding officer within this facility. So he is met by two very muscular guards that are CBs. They go down this hallway. And as they're walking down this hallway, it's, it's a long hallway. They make a left-hand turn. They go into another hallway. And that leads into a massive open area where there are military police with arms and what he ends up seeing is something fantastic. And I want to show you what this actually looks like. Let's move forward to the next one here. What he sees is a teardrop shape, 35 foot long by 12 foot high. It looks like a teardrop shaped UFO. It had a band, which I originally thought went on the side. But after I read more of the report, I believe it's now from the top. So starting from the leading edge of the craft on the top, going over the spine of the craft, and then tapering back toward the pointed end, that's what it actually looked like because he said that there was a ridge running from the top to the back over the top of the craft itself. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the full color rendering. Now, this craft had this blue coronal discharge and it was propped up on a two foot tall wooden platform. He got a real brief look at this thing, but he couldn't stay there too long. And we'll move on to the next slide here. And this is Rudy's drawing of what this craft may have looked like. You can see the ridge on top. We've absolutely got the correct two foot tall wooden platform. And we have this gentleman who is uh, delivering the package here. Now he got a good look at it, although he couldn't stay there long. So what is the more detailed information we can get from this? W was there any other sources that could verify this particular case? Well, it turns out there is more information. After this happened, this particular uh, gunnery school instructor, he actually met someone that came from San Diego, and he stated that this particular craft was shot down by a guided missile destroyer between Hawaii and the mainland. This is June of 1973. That's what he stated. So there was an independent confirmation of a gentleman who was involved before the gunnery school instructor shot down by a missile destroyer between uh, the mainland and Hawaii. We'll move forward here. So that brings to mind, and this is according to the sailor that he met, the Glomar Explorer. And you can see that this is Howard Hughes Glomar Explorer, which was designed to recover minerals and deposits and was involved in CIA operations, a lot of hush-hush operations. Interesting that we should highlight that, and this is the newspaper clipping here. Mystery ship shifts anchorage. Crew stays mum. Uh, newspaper clipping indicating the retrieval operation. This is the Honolulu Advertiser, August 19th, 1974. And we'll move on to the next slide here. 
which gives you another newspaper clipping, How CIA Divers Retrieve Russian Secrets, San Francisco Examiner, March 19th, 1975. So what does this involve? And this is a book called A Matter of Risk. Some of you might know about this, the incredible inside story of the CIA's Hughes Glomar Explorer mission to raise a Russian submarine. During 1973 to 1974, a Russian submarine was recovered from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. However, that's not all that was recovered. According to the Stringfield Report, and this is in regards to the sailor that this uh, gunnery instructor met later on, uh, he stated that, and this is directly from the report, according to our key's informant, the object was retrieved by the Glomar Explorer, shipped to Hawaii, and then sent stateside, finally to Chicago. A sketch of the craft was drawn by the sailor, and according to RK, there was little doubt that it was the same object he had seen in the Quonset hut. So we have independent confirmation that the United States Navy retrieved this USO or UFO. They brought it back to Great Lakes Naval Training Center, and they were probably doing a reverse engineering propulsion system technology investigation at that time. So what this means is, is it means that Howard Hughes knew about this. It was his ship. And there's no way that he would have not known what was going on. So we can bet that Howard Hughes knew about this. So I want to thank you for your attention. We have another part to uh, continue with this Retrievals of the Third Kind series. Uh, I will do a third part. We have many more cases. I'm still doing drawings with Rudy, and I definitely want to thank you for your attention.